Hello. Greetings from the University of Texas at Austin. I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, Paul Rosen for inviting me to participate in this uh, important uh, memorial symposium. I also want to extend my greetings and my uh, uh, sympathies to uh, uh, Shirley Steele, Barbara Scurla's wife, to Barbara Scurla's sons, and other members of the Scurla family. When I think about uh, Barbara Scorla's contributions to the field of conditioning and learning, I'm reminded by a brief interaction that I had with him on a trip to the Galapagos Islands that I took with my wife, Deborah Stout, and Shirley and Bob. We were on one of the smaller islands and we had a steep embarkment to climb. And I was reaching up trying to grab a piece of grass or something and pull myself up. Bob was right behind me. And he said, Mike, why don't you get on my shoulders? <laughs> and I laughed and I said, hey, I've been trying to do that my entire career. And all of us in the field of conditioning and learning have been trying to do that most of our careers. And Barbara Scorla has lifted up on the quality of the scholarship in the science that we all do. And it's interesting to note that he's done that even uh, in the case of individuals like me who don't study risk type problems. So how has Bob risk elevated my scholarship? Well, he's done that in three ways. First of all, he has a remarkable clarity of thought. Bob has moved from problem to problem to problem. And each time he encounters a particular, it takes on a particular issue, he goes in there and he figures out what that issue is all about. And uh, he sorts everything out and figures out what the relevant variables are, what the relevant uh, experimental manipulations might be. And, uh, and sometimes he provides new language to talk about that phenomena. And, uh, and he, he, he uh, makes it all seem so transparent and obvious and clear, so that after you read one of these Rescorla papers, you have this sort of aha experience. Aha, so that's what this problem is all about. Another thing that uh, Bob is, uh, is just spectacular at <laughs> is, um, is designing experiments, and he's a masterful methodologist. And he became famous for that uh, early on with the random control uh, procedure. But uh, he, he has done that same kind of revolutionary uh, contributions to uh, uh, what's considered an acceptable experimental design as he's moved from one problem uh, to another. And finally, Bob is, uh, has uh, uh, tremendously altered the way we teach uh, conditioning and, and learning. But uh, before I get into more details about that, uh, let me try to put Bob's uh, work in, um, in historical context. So this slide shows the landmarks uh, in the study of associations. An association is a linkage between two events, A and B, and once that association has been learned, and then the presentation of the first event activates the memory and, and behavior relevant to the second event, even though the second event is not present. Now, the study of associations goes back as far as Aristotle, who proposed the three primary rules of associations, namely contiguity, similarity, and contrast. And he should have quit with the first two, because contrast, it doesn't work. Uh, but Barbara Scorla is uh, one of the few contemporary scientists who's actually done res uh, research and collected data relevant to the first two of Aristotle's primary laws, namely contiguity and similarity. And uh, he solved the uh, paradox of simultaneous conditioning. In simultaneous conditioning, you, the two events are presented simultaneously, so that provides the best contiguity. Nevertheless, you often have trouble seeing evidence of conditioning with a simultaneous conditioning procedure. Riscola figure figured out why that was the case. Well, then the next uh, major uh, uh, advancement in the uh, analysis of associations occurred with the British empiricists who formulated a number, lots of, <laughs> lots of uh, secondary laws of associations. 
and then nothing much happened uh, for a couple hundred years until the middle of the 19th century and uh, the turn of the 19th or 20th century when uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Hermann Ebbinghaus and Ivan Pavlov, began the emp systematic empirical investigation of mechanisms of associations and Robert Ruscarlo has very much pushed that uh, line of investigation forward and in uh, um, uh, significant ways. And uh, his contributions have turned out to be relevant to the entire field of uh, conditioning and learning. So uh, this particular slide is an attempt to uh, characterize the, the playing field, <laughs> the range of things that people do uh, who study conditioning and learning these days. Uh, there is one category of uh, investigations that are focused on neural mechanisms of learning and memory, and there are lots of uh, people working in that area and doing lots of exciting things. Uh, then uh, there are behavioral studies of the behavioral mechanisms of learning memory, and that's where Bob Scorla spent all of his life. And, uh, and then there's a third category, animal cognition and evolution and ecology of learning and memory, where I have spent my life. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, associations, uh, both in terms conceptually and in terms of um, methods uh, are uh, employed in all three of these areas of inqu inquiry, making uh, Bob Scholar's work relevant to all of these uh, areas. Now, I told you that uh, one of the things that um, Bob uh, did is to uh, substantially alter the way we teach uh, conditioning and learning. And uh, I've been uh, teaching <laughs> in this area for nearly 50 years. And in addition to the using the, doing the usual professorial stuff of of uh, getting kids to uh, take a class and then showing up trying to teach them something. Uh, I've also spent a lot of my career developing educational materials and for about 40 years uh, and that consisted primarily of uh, writing books on conditioning and learning uh, with the uh, lockdown uh, and with COVID. Uh, I also uh, produced uh, 36, uh, three dozen uh, instructional videos on conditioning and learning. And for Roscorla enthusiasts, <laughs> you might be a, uh, get a kick out of the fact that um, my video on the Roscorla Wagner model and its relevance to uh, the development of self-driving cars uh, is the most popular <laughs> among the videos that I've got out there on, in, on YouTube. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I, I wrote a lot of books. And uh, one that has uh, uh, really uh, come to uh, dominate the field and, and, and for a long time uh, is this book, Principles of Learning and, and Behavior, which first appeared in 1982 and uh, is currently, uh, uh, remains in wide usage uh, now in its seventh edition. And when I wrote this book, I, I didn't uh, want to... Uh, uh, advocate a particular point of view. I want to present a, an eclectic, uh, balanced description of what the field was all about. And so I, was, I didn't want to produce a, a, a primarily a Pavlovian book or a, a Skinnerian-oriented kind of book. There were books of, uh, of that, uh, particularly Skinnerian-oriented book. There are lots of books like that. I want to do a kind of a, an eclectic thing. And uh, I thought it might be interesting <laughs> It was interesting to me <laughs> to uh, uh, trace um, Bob Rascorla's contributions to the field by looking to see how various editions of this book treated his work. And for many of these editions, uh, uh, that preceded any personal relationship I had with Bob. And so I thought I'd count the number of pages <laughs> of each edition uh, of, uh, in which um, Bob Rascorla's uh, work was described. And here, here are those data across the seventh, seven editions of the book. You can see the first couple of editions, he was cited on uh, 30 pages. Uh, sometimes it went up a little bit, and, but we kind of hovered around 30. And that's a pretty healthy number. I mean, if I pick, a book, uh, pick up a book on learning and memory and uh, I look to see how many pages my work is cited on, it, I don't think I've ever found a book that cited me on 30 different pages. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I thought, uh, you know, in trying to interpret these numbers, uh, we need a comparison. 
And uh, who, who should we compare Bob to? Well, one of the people I th thought would be highly relevant is, is Alan Wagner. Everybody thinks about Bob Rascorla as the guy who's associated with the uh, Rascorla Wagner model. And if that was his primary contribution, then Wagner should appear on as many pages as, uh, as Bob Rascorla. So I collected data on, uh, on Alan Wagner, and then I thought, well, we should really go for a really famous psychologist that every undergraduate knows uh, in this area. And then so I said, well, how about B.F. Skinner? So I counted a number of pages on, on which B.F. Skinner appeared. And then I threw in data for Ralph Miller for reasons I needn't uh, elaborate here. And here are those data. <clears throat> so <laughs> I was uh, really pleased to, uh, to see that when I uh, put this in, uh, in, in an Excel graphing program, uh, the Excel file picked blue. Uh, as the color to represent the data for Bob Rascorla because that, uh, you know, blue is the color of the striped shirts that he always wore. And I guess the Excel program associated Rascorla with blue just the way kind of I do. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, this is the data for all seven editions. And you can see that Bob beats out uh, B.F. Skinner. Uh, in every edition, Bob beats out Alan Wagner in every edition. Uh, Bob beats out uh, uh, Ralph Miller in every edition, though there is some variability. And the next question that you might ask, well, uh, uh, there are a lot of pages, okay, but uh, how many chapters uh, is the work uh, uh, discussed in? And so in this next uh, uh, figure, I've got the number of chapters with citations of uh, all of these individuals, and I got tired of counting these things, so I only have the first edition, the fourth edition, and the seventh edition. And you can see that uh, uh, Skinner beat out uh, Bob in the first and the fourth edition, but uh, uh, Bob was the winner by far over everybody in the seventh edition. So the field of learning is becoming more and more, more Rescorla's field. And then you might ask, well, what are these chapters? Well, if you look at the uh, first edition, it's the usual stuff. Uh, two chapters on classical conditioning. I have lots of references to Rescorla. You'd expect that. Uh, chapter on avoidance and punishment uh, cites Bob's work on avoidance learning. Uh, then there is uh, chapter 11. There was an entire chapter in that book uh, devoted to interactions of classical and instrumental conditioning. And this chapter took up the history of uh, the study of this problem going back to Holland Spence and then uh, Sol uh, Rescorla and Solomon. Uh, and uh, uh, what's uh, interesting about this is uh, that uh, uh, the chapter kind of ended strong. And you know, this, is a, this is a book that came out in 1982. And 1982 was really the height uh, or the 80s. And there were lots of experiments, 70s and 80s, uh, uh, using what's called a transfer of control of design, where you uh, test the effects of a Pavlovian conditioning, condition stimulus on uh, the rate of ongoing operant uh, behavior. And this uh, <clears throat> transfer of control design, uh, what's now called Pavlovian intramural transfer, uh, 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 was a procedure that uh, uh, Rescorla helped to develop. And uh, along with, you know, as I, as I said, he's always sort of clarifying how, should, how we should study these things. And so in this uh, Rescorla Solomon paper in 1967, they kind of uh, spelled all this out, and uh, and it, that generated just hundreds of experiments on uh, Pavlovian instrumental transfer that continue today. It is a methodology that is of great interest to a neuroscientist because it allows them to study the neural mechanisms of incentive motivation and how that affects uh, goal-directed uh, behavior. <laughs> what contemporary neuroscientists don't re recognize is that they're using the rationale and the methodology that Bob Rascola developed whenever they're using that design. 
How about uh, the seventh edition? This is when the book is becoming a Rescorla book. Here, uh, uh, Bob's work is uh, cited in there. Uh, uh, eight of 12 chapters. Now, one of the things you have to realize about re uh, bringing out new editions of a textbook, you can't keep just adding material. You can't keep just adding chapters. <laughs> All of the editions of the book were 12 chapters. And so each time you add material, you have to take some material out. And uh, a chapter on Pavlovian interactions was uh, redistributed to other chapters. But here there's a new chapter on extinction. And uh, Bob, uh, Bob's work is heavily represented uh, there. But what are these phenomena that, uh, that we, uh, we find uh, useful to talk about when we talk about uh, conditioning and learning in general? So these are, um, this is my list of Rescorla learning effects. <laughs> and there are so many of these effects uh, that I put them on two different slides. I already mentioned the first of these were all st stimulus similarity and conditioning. They already uh, mentioned the random control. <clears throat> Condition inhibition, this is an interesting story. In 69, uh, uh, Bob Rescorla published a paper in Psych Bulletin <coughs> in which he did his usual thing. He took a particular topic, in this case, condition inhibition, reviewed the literature, figured out what's the important thing uh, and how to study it and so forth, and came up with a methodology for study of condition inhibition in which he proposed uh, sort of the dual tests of condition inhibition, the summation test and the retardation of acquisition test. But what's interesting here is that he's talking about inhibition as uh, a, uh, the, a, simil a similar kind of learning process as excitation, except in the case of inhibition, the conditioned stimulus suppresses uh, the conditioned response. And that's kind of how Pavlov thought about it. And that's how the Rescorla Wagner model characterizes in inhibition. Inhibition is, is a learning process that, uh, uh, that progresses uh, by s the same kind of mechanisms as the learning of excitation, but in a in a, uh, the opposite uh, direction. Uh, we also have this okay, CSGS contingency effects, which is a, sort of a, a, an ex, uh, extension of the his arguments in a random control procedure. And, and then he did a lot of work on higher order conditioning, and the only book that uh, Bob Rescorler published uh, was devoted to second order conditioning. Uh, uh, we also have US devaluation effects, which is a technique that he uh, uh, perfected. And, uh, and, and uh, recognize the tremendous versatility of this procedure to uh, address all kinds of really interesting theoretical questions. The initial questions had to do with distinction between SR versus SR, SS learning. Uh, of course, there's the Rescorla Wagner model and then uh, two process theory, which I've already uh, talked about. Uh, but there are more effects. <laughs> uh, top of the list here is the RO association. Well, what does R stand for? Well, of course, R stands for a response. But um, this is uh, now at the beginning of uh, Bob's uh, analysis of instrumental conditioning. And he uses O to represent the reinforcer or the reward that the subject or the goal object that the subject obtains when he makes an instrumental response. And uh, this is one example where Bob Rescorla introduced new language. Skinner called the, uh, the reward or reinforcer the reinforcer. <laughs> and uh, Bob thought that uh, that term was not just descriptive but had theoretical baggage. He didn't want theoretical, theoretical baggage. And so he used a more procedurally neutral term, uh, response outcome. Uh, he, there's also studies of um, hierarchical associations, and uh, Bob, uh, uh, along with Ruth Colwell, and, uh, did a lot of work on uh, hierarchical associations, uh, and they're all in instrumental conditioning, and it's a hierarchy because it's not one event being associated with another, but it's one event being associated with an associative unit. So here are the associations between S and the RO unit. And uh, uh, they studied these kinds of hierarchical association, not just in instrumental conditioning, but also in Pavlovian paradigms, uh, which is what's referred to in the next item, stimulus controlled by conditional relations. 
And this is a line of work that was started by Peter Holland, but um, Bob got into the game and uh, introduced new vocabulary, new methods, and on and on. Uh, and sort of uh, I recreated it or created it um, uh, to, more to his liking. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, what's interesting here is that uh, when Bob was doing these experiments on uh, stimulus control by conditional relations in a Pavlovian par paradigm, he realized that conditioned inhibition is not the opposite of conditioned excitation. That conditioned excitation involves an association between just two events and is not a conditional relation or a hierarchical relation, whereas conditioned inhibition is a conditional relation or a hierarchical relation. So his conception of conditioned inhibition substantially shifted at this point uh, and he, he adopted a view that now is contrary to Rascorla Wagnamon. And uh, of course, uh, moving on to the second column, uh, you see um, Bob's mo more recent work on, uh, on extinction, uh, did a beautiful control experiment on spontaneous recovery. He invented a new procedure for uh, enhancing extinction involving the compounding of extinction stimuli. And then he uh, did experiments to demonstrate that uh, extinction involved in an inhibitory SR association. Now, this is a different form of inhibition than when the inhibitions that I've been talking about before. And I think one of the really interesting things that uh, uh, I hope we get sorted out is how this uh, notion of an inhibitory SR association is related to Pavlovian conditioned inhibition and other forms of uh, learned inhibition. This brings me to the end of uh, this whirlwind tour <laughs> of Rascorla phenomena. Uh, I hope I have uh, convinced you that Rascorla rebuilt the landscape of much of the field of conditioning and learning and created a new starting point for generations of investigators to come. And because of that, his influence will continue to be broad and long-lasting. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, may you all be well. May you all stay safe. And may Barbara Scorla rest in peace. Bye-bye.